This video is sponsored by Incogni. China is panicking in the face of the new United States anti-ballistic missile defenses. I don't think they are panicking, sir. Yes, I know, Otis, I just wanted to be a bit more YouTube-y, you know? To get the vibe, get into the groove. Are we talking about Chinese ballistic missiles and US anti-ballistic defenses? Yes, Otis, indeed we are. Intro. Okay, a conflict between the United States and some allies and China in the Western Pacific, but to achieve what? This is not the Middle Ages when the destruction of the opponent's army could be achieved and the neighboring duchy could be annexed. Try occupying Beijing and nuclear warheads will start flying, making any other consideration moot. Victory or defeat in this case will be judged by the achievement of military, political or territorial objectives. I think we should start with a plausible scenario, sir. Indeed, Otis. Indeed we should. This is something that has been already covered in detail on the channel, so this is a short version of the same discussion. Taiwan is expected to be a casus belli with China starting an invasion. I don't think it will happen as many expect. China won't invade Taiwan head-on unless it will be forced by the United States and the Taiwanese. If Taiwan formally declared its independence and the United States recognizes it, the Chinese will have to intervene because their international credibility will be shattered if they don't. Otherwise, the Chinese strategic objective is to eject the US Navy from the Western Pacific to preserve the control of the commercial routes to the Middle East and Africa. To do so, the critical path to be kept open goes through the Strait of Malacca and across the Indian Ocean. If the current rivalry with India can be dealt with diplomatically, the one with the US and its circle of close allies, well, we just assume that there will be a military solution. The military solution for the Chinese must have two main components, seizing Singapore to control the Strait of Malacca and damaging the US Navy and US Air Force and their bases in the area to an extent such that it will be incapable of denying the sea lanes to and from China. If this is achieved, Taiwan will fall with little effort and there will be no need of a full-scale invasion. Obviously, China is not ready for this, not even remotely. Even from a conceptual point of view, the current Chinese doctrine is aimed at an active defense of the national territory, which means hitting outside the borders, at incoming threats, even at long range, but from the mainland and the areas immediately around it. While the plan has some limited blue water capabilities required to secure the oceanic routes, the power projection capability to attack Singapore and US bases in the Pacific is still clearly insufficient. In my opinion, China won't make a move till when this capability will be ready, but this may easily take 20 or 30 years from now. The obvious consequence is that, if war must be, it is in the US interest to make it happen as soon as possible. Not that I like the perspective, but this is the grim reality of international politics. I don't want a war, sir. I was assembled in China, as you know. Neither do I, Otis. Neither do I. What would be the United States strategic objective in this war? It will surely be the defeat of the attack on Taiwan, because remember, we are not in the case that China would prefer, but in the case where China is forced to attack Taiwan. So the US objective would be to defeat the attack on Taiwan, but also a substantial reduction of Chinese naval and their power in order to push back China 15 or 20 years in terms of capabilities. Moreover, the islands in the South China Sea should be neutralized and occupied to ensure that the key sea lanes are no longer under Chinese control. This obviously requires a complex... Excuse me, I forgot to silence the phone. Why did you not answer, sir? It might be important. No, what is it? It was just a robocall. I, I get tons of those. I sometimes call you, sir, and I am a robot. Is this a discriminatory behavior? Of course not, Otis. The problem is that there are data brokers that collect your data and sell them online. This is the kind of problem that Incogni, that, by the way, is sponsoring this video, is brilliantly solving. 
I often collect data, sir. Yes, Otis, but you're just helping with the research. The people who buy these data don't have good intentions. In the best case, you are inundated by unwanted calls and emails. In the worst case, they can steal your identity and do really nasty things pretending to be you. Well, sir, actually... No, I don't want to know the details. Actually, I think I have to report you to Incogni. What does it mean, sir? Well, Otis, what Incogni does is contacting these brokers on your behalf and ask them to remove you from the lists. They have to do this because it's the law. You could do it yourself, but there are easily dozens, if not hundreds, of brokers, and the procedure is often very complex and time-consuming. With Incogni, you just sit down and let them do the job. Moreover, they keep checking if you show up again in these lists and remove you again. Is it painful? Otis, you don't have pain receptors, and it is more painful for those who are targeted. Go figure, once I received a robocall stating that I was going to be arrested if I didn't call an extremely expensive number. I understand, sir. Very well, Otis. And you, Xteam viewers, please use the code MIL7 at the link below to get an exclusive 60% off an annual Incogni plan. And now back to the video. So the scenario we're working on is a forced Chinese attack on Taiwan and US bases in the Pacific, while US tries to fend off the attack and disable the Chinese military instrument for the long period, while at the same time occupying the South China Sea to control the main sea lanes leading to and from China. This would be a joint forces campaign, obviously, happening in the near future, no more than three or four years from now, and we are focusing in this video on the ballistic missile operations. Obviously. As explained above, the Chinese would be forced to initiate the war and the first strike would be a decapitation strike of the US forces in the area. And it's easy to imagine that the first confrontation would be the Chinese ballistic force against the United States anti-missile force. And the Chinese missile force is considered an elite unit and it is rapidly expanding with new missile models. The Chinese deploy several different ballistic missiles, ranging from ICBMs to long-range artillery rockets. We are interested in two medium and intermediate ballistic missiles that have the range to reach the US bases in Japan, the Philippines and Guam. The most important weapons in use are the DF-21, the DF-26 and the DF-17. The DF-21 and the more modern DF-26 are ballistic missiles with MARVs, while the DF-16 features a hypersonic glider. What are MARVs, sir? Otis, why are you asking? You know perfectly well. Because you tend to give knowledge for granted, sir. Ah, uh, okay, good point. So, let's open a parenthesis about the ballistic missiles and their features. So, a ballistic missile is called ballistic because it is unguided. The rocket engine propels the missile out of the atmosphere, but when the burn is over, the missile has no way of course correcting. It is also intuitive how a ballistic missile cannot be very accurate, since it is not controlled for most of the trajectory. A medium or intermediate range ballistic missile has a circular error probability that may easily be in the hundreds of meters, if not kilometers. With no propulsion and no air to aerodynamically steer the missile, its trajectory is a given. With a good enough computer and a good enough radar, you can calculate the impact point right after the end of the burn. An interceptor has a relatively easy life because it can be sent toward a known impact point with its own terminal guidance. To increase the accuracy and avoid interceptors, various technologies have been developed during the Cold War and the development is still ongoing today. MIRVs are a variation of the ballistic missile. The warheads are independent and released by a vehicle mounted on top of the missile that can maneuver and orient itself in space, usually called the bus. You can't really target the bus from the ground because you are targeting the intermediate phase when it is still ascending before the apex. At the apex, or shortly afterwards, the bus may release the warheads aiming each one to a different target. The trajectory of each warhead, while still purely ballistic, is unknown still after the release. But these systems are often used with nuclear weapons and we don't want to see any of them in our scenario. More interesting and in use with conventional weapons are the MARVs. 
A MARV is a vehicle which is capable of maneuvering outside the atmosphere, inside the atmosphere or both. After the rocket burns, the vehicle separates and either uses thrusters or aerodynamic devices to maneuver. And by the way, the aerodynamic devices are generally not just wings, they are often quite substantial blocks of material that increase the drag on one side of the vehicle, which usually is conical. This changes the angles of attack and produces lift, and the lift changes the trajectory. Obviously, a cone hurtling towards the ground doesn't have much lift, but it can be enough to change the direction of several degrees. These are not large trajectory variations, but they are good enough to achieve very small circular error probabilities in the order of a few meters and potentially to avoid the interceptors. The MARV guidance can either be inertial, which is not very accurate, but surely a progress from purely ballistic, or by a GNSS that alone could become very accurate. Some weapons have a terminal guidance system, which could be either optical or radar. That allows for even greater accuracy and, critically, it allows engaging moving targets like ships at sea. So this maneuvering capability can also be used to execute randomized trajectory variations to evade the interceptors. As far as we know today, no MARV has a way of detecting an interceptor directed at it, hence it needs to randomize its maneuvers. The MARVs always have an advantage on the interceptor because doing some math a bit too complex for a YouTube video, you can demonstrate that the interceptor needs two or three times the lateral acceleration of the MARV to have a reasonable chances to hit the target. And with the same math, you can demonstrate that the faster the interceptor, the highest is the kill probability. Therefore, the interceptor will always be much more complex than the MARV, and it will require very fast reaction times. A hypersonic glider is an aerodynamic vehicle which is launched as a rocket payload, but rather than flying a ballistic or near-ballistic trajectory, it flies a flat trajectory in the upper layers of the atmosphere at altitudes around 35 to 40 kilometers. The advantage is the reduced detectability by long-range radars and the possibility to maneuver, aerodynamically maneuver. While maneuvering tend to reduce speed and range, HGVs are capable of substantial variations of direction, 30 to 40 degrees, making them rather difficult targets. They tend to be heavier than MARVs, so the range is reduced, everything else being equal, but they also have enhanced capabilities to penetrate the defenses. Some say that the advantage in respect to MARVs is not enough to justify the additional complexity, but as of today, we have no elements to call this point. As we said, the most important weapons in use in this context are the DF-21, the DF-26 and the DF-17. The DF-21 has a maximum range of 2,150 km with a nuclear warhead, however, for conventional attacks with a 600 kg explosive warhead, the range is believed to be below 2,000 km. It is a two-stage solid rocket missile which entered service in 1991. However, the C variant, which entered service in 2006, features a MAR vehicle with terminal guidance. The D variant is very particular because it is a specialized anti-ship weapon with a MARV and terminal guidance as well. The DF-26 is a two-stage solid fuel intermediate ballistic missile. It is designed to quickly swap nuclear and conventional warhead and in this sense it is a potentially destabilizing weapon. It is a modern weapon, it had a service in 2016 and it has been produced in relatively large numbers. The range is 4000 km and the payload is 1200 kg, so quite substantial. It is equipped with a large MARV featuring inertial and satellite guidance. Apparently, there is an anti-ship variant with terminal guidance and tests have been observed with the missile hitting a moving target at sea. The DF-17 is a unique weapon, at least for now, since it features a hypersonic glider. It enters service in 2019 and the part of the range estimated to be about 1600 km, little is known about it. It is relatively small if compared with the other missiles, but its role is probably attacking the anti-missile defenses themselves. China currently deploys six brigades with DF-26, four brigades with DF-21, and four brigades with DF-17. 
All the missiles are launched by mobile TELS and every brigade deploys 12 to 18 launchers, but the exact number varies. This gives a hypothetical salvo of these three models of about 260 ballistic missiles, after which the TELS need to be reloaded. And we do not have an idea of how long it is going to take and how many reloads are available. It could be just one or two, but it could easily be many more. However, we need to consider that some reloads could be older missile variants with less accurate guidance and no maneuvering re-entry vehicles, so the following salvos could lose effectiveness. Another mitigating factor is the presence of dedicated anti-ship variants, both for the DF-21 and the DF-26. These missiles will be saved to attack the US carriers should they enter their operational range. We can assume that the carriers will be out of range at the beginning of the hostilities, so potentially 20% of, of all the available missiles will not be part of the first strike. Considering the usual attrition rate and the fact that we may expect by the time this scenario plays out at least two to four new brigades, a realistic opening salvo may include about 240 missiles, give or take, but all with modern high accuracy and maneuvering warheads, while a second or a third salvo may include increasing proportion of less accurate weapons. On the defensive side, US forces will rely on three systems. TAD, Aegis on ships and in the Ashore variant, and Patriot. The TAD system in the Pacific Theater is deployed on Guam. It is an exo-atmospheric system that relies on a hit-to-kill interceptor. The missile accelerates at Mach 8, exiting the densest part of the atmosphere and releasing the vehicle towards the target. It is reported to be capable of hitting a target at an altitude up to 150 kilometers. It had a pretty tribulated development, but in recent years, tests were successful and the system deployed in Bahrain managed to intercept a ballistic missile launched by the Houthis in 2022. It has a weak point though. Its kill vehicle is infrared guided and it can't hit targets below 40 kilometers of altitude because the atmospheric friction generates too much heat. A third battery has a total of 48 missiles ready for launch. There is no doubt that the system will be perfectly capable to intercept ballistic missiles aimed at the island or at any other target that it is protecting. The effectiveness against exo-atmospheric maneuvering re-entry vehicles, though, is a question mark. While a conventional simple ballistic missile will likely require just one interceptor, MARVs probably will require several to be hit. The Aegis system is a standard combat management system of the US Navy. It is well known and it has demonstrated its functionalities in several different situations. A land-based system is being built on Guam, but it is conceivable that the US Navy will deploy at least one ship nearby every potential target. The most capable weapon used by the Aegis in this context is the SM-3. It features a kinetic interceptor and its ceiling is measured in hundreds of kilometers, allowing for early intercepts even of intermediate ballistic missiles. It is very fast with a maximum ascent speed over Mach 13. The missile third stage features a dual-pulse rocket motor capable of still accelerating well outside the atmosphere. The Seeker is an advanced infrared seeker and the system has onboard capabilities to discriminate real targets from the coils. However, the missile can be guided from the ground through radars or data links. For an anti-ballistic missile system, it has been produced in relatively large numbers and probably there will be, at the time of our scenario, about a thousand missiles in service of various variants. However, ships can store a limited number of SM3s in their cells since other missile types are required for defense and offense. Even in a situation in which the ship has a dedicated anti-ballistic mission, it is difficult to think that it will embark more than 40 or 50 missiles. And the SM3 is a large missile, the latest versions are even bigger, so you can't do tricks like code packing or anything like that. The SM6 missile is quickly becoming the mainstay of the Aegis ships since it is a actually multi-purpose missile, very effective against air targets, but also ground targets and ballistic weapons. 
In this context, it features terminal stage anti-ballistic capabilities, but while the SM3 can cover a relatively large area, the SM6 is almost a point defense against the ballistic missiles. Moreover, its speed is between Mach 4 and 5, which is not much in this context. It is probably the main anti-ballistic weapon with US Navy, simply because it's embarked in large numbers. The SM2, which is the low-end weapon, is still the most common missile in service and it will remain for the near future. In the most recent variants, it features limited terminal stage anti-ballistic capabilities as well, but it's just not designed for the purpose of intercepting intermediate ballistic missiles. Even in this case, while these systems are perfectly capable of intercepting ballistic targets within their own engagement parameters, their effectiveness against maneuvering targets is still a question mark. The US Army Patriot system is well known. The Pac-3 missile is designed specifically to engage tactical ballistic missiles and it has demonstrated this capability in recent times. This improved the somewhat mixed reputation it earned in the 90s and in the early 2000s. The Pac-3 missile is faster and more maneuverable than the SM-2 and the SM-6 and it should have an engagement range slightly better than the SM-6. Its effectiveness is due to the original steering system, which relies on single-use thrusters all around the missile, giving it an excellent lateral acceleration in the high atmosphere. After all, since it is an impact vehicle, there is a lot of room available that is not occupied by the warhead. A Patriot battery in the US Army usually features six launchers, but not all of them are equipped with Pac-3 launch containers, because they need other weapons uh, to engage more conventional targets. The important element that ties all these defenses together is the possibility to receive targeting data from multiple sources. This is a process that is involving the entire US Armed Forces, where data are networked by multiple systems and it is quickly evolving in what the Americans, in their doctrinal publications, call the sensor network, where each sensor is a node regardless of its nature. The integration happens at different levels and it's not yet total and complete, it will probably take a few years from now. For example, the SM3 can directly receive guidance data from satellites, but the Patriot or the TAD can't. Anyway, this is an important advantage, in this way each target is allocated the most appropriate interceptor and the effectiveness and efficiency are maximized. Early warnings allow for early launches, reducing the need of redundancy, saving interceptors, which are always in short supply. So, how would US defenses do against the Chinese ballistic missiles? Well, one-on-one, -on -one, they would surely do very well. Problem is, it will never be one-on-one. -on -one. And actually comparing the, the F-26 against the TAD uh, doesn't really mean much. It is always the overall tactical situation that needs to be addressed, so let's start with the targets. There are plenty of US installations in the area, but the ones we are concerned with are the air bases hosting combat units. This may not be the Chinese integrated plan, but we need to somewhat place boundaries on the consideration we are going to do, otherwise we would need to simulate the entire war in the Western Pacific. So what are the main targets? The main targets are the air bases, because the mainstay of the US military power is air power. We have Misawa in Japan, Kadena on the island of Okinawa, and Anderson in Guam. Plus in Japan, Okinawa and other Mariana Islands, there are other smaller air bases that could be viable targets, but we focus on the big ones. By the time our scenario takes place, the US will have five air bases in the Philippines, and we can easily speculate that one or two will host combat units. Each of these bases are within reach from the missiles launched from continental China, except for Guam, which is only reachable by the DF-26. Misawa, Kadena and Anderson are very large installations, well protected, and they are considered the key of the US air power in the area. Kadena and Misawa are hardened bases with shelters available for the combat aircraft, Anderson is less so. However, in all bases, tankers and AWACS will be parked either outside or in non-protected hangars. It is also possible that in the imminence of the hostilities, the bases will be overcrowded and there won't be enough shelters for all the high-value assets present on the base. 
These bases are highly paying target that the Chinese will want to attack as a matter of high priority. In fact, the flight time in this case will be short enough to limit the number of aircraft that can take off before the warheads start impacting. How many warheads would be necessary to neutralize or severely damage one of these bases? Let's take the example of Mizawa. From the satellite images on Bing and Google, I counted 60 hardened shelters and something big enough to comfortably host two aircraft. Plus, there is a flight line which is more than a kilometer long, plus there are some more open parking spots that could be occupied in, in a pre-war situation. There is a 3,000 meters of runway and an equally long taxiway that could be used in case of emergency. There is an area, probably half a square kilometer, that seems occupied by ordnance shelters and somewhere underground there should be a large fuel depot. I can't see it, but I'm sure the Chinese intelligence will know where to find it. So, let's count. 60 shelters to hit with one warhead each. 10 warheads for the flight line, each one 100 meters apart. Six warheads to crater the runway and six more to crater the taxiway. I would say 15 to 20 warheads to hit the ordnance depot. Let's say five penetrating warheads to hit the fuel depot. Moreover, you may want to hit some other installations where the pilots and the crews may be, like sleeping quarters, the canteen, the control tower, the common and control areas, and so on. Let's say 10 to 20 more warheads. Therefore, the total number of hits needed to completely neutralize Mizawa is 117 warheads. And this with no redundancy, that is, each warhead must work perfectly well and hit the designated target. As you can see, air bases are a tough target that requires a lot of hits to be completely neutralized for a significant amount of time. If we agree that the Chinese may have an initial salvo of 240 missiles, a single air base will absorb half of those. And all of this if the base is not defended, but we can be sure that they will be defended. So let's suppose that Mizawa is defended by a Patriot battery, a Tad battery, and since it is near the ocean, there is an ally Burke with SM3s nearby. If the Patriot battery is completely dedicated to the anti-ballistic role, there will be 48 interceptors available, plus 48 TAD interceptor, plus 50 or 60 between SM3s and SM6 from the ship. This will mean that there will be, give or take, 150 interceptors at hand. In theory, enough to fend off the attack. However, it is common practice to launch more than one interceptor per target, so 150 interceptors may be just enough to intercept all the warheads. This means that Mizawa is safe from a ballistic attack. Well, not quite. If we had to use the effectiveness we have seen in the recent Iranian attack on Israel as a reference at around 75%, we can expect that about 30 warheads will hit Mizawa. Depending on what it is actually hit, these 30 warheads could do more or less damage. For example, a large chain detonation of the ammo or fuel stores would put the base out of service for many days, even if no aircraft was damaged. A series of craters on the runway would probably be repaired in a few hours. However, there is another possibility. Let's suppose that the missile attack is mostly composed by the older generation of Chinese missiles, those that are purely ballistic. They will barely fall within the base perimeter, but they cannot be ignored by the defenses. In this case, most likely, the defense will hit all of them, but maybe one, two lucky shots falling somewhere nearby. This would seem a failure at first, but the defenses will be depleted. And if the Patriot and the Tad will likely have at least a full reload available, the ship with the SM3s, which is the most capable weapon of the lot, will be mostly depleted and it will need to go somewhere to Riyar. A second wave of missiles will have an easier life and this time they will be the more accurate ones, the ones with terminal guidance or satellite guidance. If the second salvo is fired quickly, if the Chinese are faster to reload, it could catch the ground defenses while rearming and basically encounter no opposition. But let's suppose that at least partially they manage to rearm, and in this case it's not impossible to have maybe 60 or 70 accurate impacts, and this could 
not completely destroy but severely damage Mizawa and reduce its capability of generating sorties for many, many days. There's an obvious flip side of this Chinese tactic. To eliminate just one base, about 250 missiles have been used, which is a very, very large fraction of all the medium range and intermediate range Chinese ballistic missiles. Now, the Chinese have insane production capabilities, but there are limits for them too. So, will the Chinese consider a target like Mizawa important enough to spend a third of all their missiles hitting that base? We don't know. But what we know, as you can easily see, is that this is like a match of 3D chess, with several variables interacting, both in, in a deterministic and statistical way. So, in the end, it is difficult to understand who is scared of whom. Most likely, nobody's scared. Most likely, nobody's scared. And this only increases the chances of a confrontation. And I really hope I'm wrong, but I don't think so. So, thank you very much for watching this long video. It's been a honor to have your attention. Thank you to Incogni for sponsoring this video, and please use the code MIL7 at the link below to get an exclusive 60% off an annual Incogni plan. Usual enormous thank you to all those who are supporting the channel on Patreon by being a member or by any other mean that is available. Today there is also GoFundMe that you can use, it is connected with a different project, a book that I'm trying to write. It is a long-term project. If you're interested, you can find the link in the description below or the QR code on screen. And if you can support the channel, which is absolutely fine, no problem at all, please then subscribe if you haven't yet, or hit the bell, or hit like. It really helps with the algorithm. This is the end. Thank you very much for watching, and see you next time.